Right. Yeah, uh, I imagine budget was a major issue because uh, uh, the book series is, you know, if, if it was done uh, accurately to the images in the book, you know, it, this is we're talking a, a big special effects bonanza, and yeah. uh, I imagine uh, the budget wasn't even close uh, for that kind of thing. No, I think um, the budget for those shows, if I'm not mistaken, I think the budget for the shows was for a half hour, it was maybe four hundred thousand maybe four hundred fifty thousand dollars and a lot of that money was down the tubes because they had invested so much in the initial creation of these beasts like the yurks for example as i recall the yurks were basically um a headpiece and two claws and that was all they didn't build the whole yurk and i guess Mm -hmm. it hadn't occurred to them that you could do stop motion for example or um cgi wasn't really as as certainly not as cheap and definitely not as uh, sort of all pervasive as it is now. Sure. Because I would just CGI those things. I mean, that would make the most sense. And, and you could build them and make them look great and it wouldn't cost you a fortune. Back then, it probably kind of did. Um, so they had these like puppety things and it was kind of like the Muppets gone to hell is really what a lot of this stuff was like. And right. and they just, again, it was like, I think there was conceptually they were figuring here's how we can do this for a budget and I think there had been a lot of sort of research mistakes made. I remember standing on set one day when one of those blue half horse things were going on and we had the guy painted in blue and he stuck into the front end of this sort of horse's ass and um, I, I looking at this thing and thinking this is just so cheesy, you know, and and I think part of it was budget but part of it also is it's the required, there's a certain vision or a certain way to make a show like that even on a budget. I mean the Twilight Zone did it with a tenth of our budgets and you know you have to write this the thing down and, and it was a very ambitious show and I would love to see it I think you're right I would love to see it done because I think there's still a story there I think mm. the idea of Animorphs not God knows not to do the entire book series because they do go on but the idea of that world being turned into a feature film it's it's likely past its due date because I don't think people remember it terribly fondly mm. But it would be an interesting thing to see. I would love to see it done with CG effects and, and really done up well, you know, because right. it's an interesting idea. These these teenagers, uh, if basically kids at the verge of puberty, suddenly discovering that, that not only are they changing this way, they can change that way too. Right. Now, uh, the book series, uh, by the time the series had started, was about, about 25 books in, uh, which was about just <laughs> under halfway its run. Um, so the series still had a lot of stories going forwards. Mm. Uh, was there a challenge in um, adapting a series that was still going on? Like you p- could probably do something that would contradict a book that would later down the line, or um, you might end up lapping the books. Mm. You know, let me think about that. I my recollection was I think I wrote what I wrote maybe three episodes during the run of the show, and then the final three. Um, I don't recall being slavishly devoted to the books when they came to me to look at because they would send you the book and say "All right, can you turn this into a half hour script and I don't remember there being again it's it's that that single vision thing you need on a television series you need a showrunner you need a guy or a girl Mm -hmm. who has an overview of the whole thing and so something like you're talking about which is like the Contradictions in terms of what's happened earlier on, or 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 lapping the books, um, you need to have one person who does that, and there really wasn't that person. So it's entirely possible things did get did get screwed up, you know, in terms of what had already gone on. My suspicion is that television viewership is somewhat larger than book readership in this country. Sad to say, but entirely true. And so I expect that the small percentage of the book readers who will, who who represented the television viewership, you know, because there'd be a big TV viewership and this many people probably read the books. I imagine they may have had issues around it, but I don't recall it ever being a real creative problem. I mean, nobody ever said, you know, in book number nine, this guy did that. So in book number 18 or in show number 18, this did that. They're, they're quite standalone um, situations. They pulled from the books, but I don't recall them ever actually following that closely. So. so there was no. I know most TV series have like a, a series bible. Uh, Animorphs didn't have that. 
they I think had one of the first the first couple of episodes I think they had one written or something um, I don't recall ever seeing it to be right. honest now this is 10 years ago you know or, or sure. less, like 15 years ago. so you know I don't know um, but I don't recall ever seeing it I remember getting sent scripts and I think the first I recall this the first director who directed the first pilot episode and the other bits he would make the actors carry around the full script in their binders now if you know uh, during the day now if you know anything about production um Normally, you just carry sides for the day. So whatever scenes you have for the day are basically mm-hmm. put down in little sides you can carry them around. And this guy was—he um, made them carry the, the whole scripts around. And I, when I came into the show, they were like, "He makes us do this." And I said, well, "Why? Why are you dragging your scripts around on set every day? This is absurd." Well, because he wants us to be all invested in that. That's nonsense. So we got rid of that real fast. But I think decisions like that, this guy was obsessed with, and I don't think he maybe paid as much attention because he was the guy hired. I think as to sort of oversee the thing and I don't think that I think he was a you know to speak well of the he's not dead yet well anyway to speak well of the past um, I don't think that he was as creatively invested as he was um, egotistically invested in in having his vision put on the show and and, you know I don't think that they ever followed it I think there were things like okay, they have to touch the animal, absorb the DNA, and then change. That's the only rule that they ever had. That and um, have a couple of really goofy-looking puppet animals during the movie. Right. Uh, who was more in charge of the production, uh, Nickelodeon or Scholastics? Um, trying to think. Uh, you know, because we were doing Goosebumps and Animorphs at the same time. Right. So my susp- a lot of overlap. So my suspicion mm-hmm. is that that I want to say Scholastic, because I remember Deborah Forte, marvelous lady, and she was sort of in charge of the production side of this of their books. Mm-hmm. Um, Deborah was she was also involved in uh, one of their big movies they did based on a book. I forget the movie, but kind of came the Golden Compass. Right, came out and I didn't do so hot. But Deborah was in charge of that. She's very creative, very nice lady. Um, I recall she was involved in it. She was pretty much hands on with the scripts, um, mm-hmm. and kind of overseeing that stuff. But again, in terms of an actual day to day, they had lots of producers. They had, you know, line producers and they had physical producers and people who could say you can spend this much money, that much money. But they didn't have this one creative voice. That I think that oversaw the whole thing, and that was really the flaw in the execution of that show because that sh- that show should have I mean it could have lasted quite a bit longer than it did because it had mm-hmm. a really good you know underlying idea certainly mm-hmm. as strong as certainly some of the stuff we've seen so yeah I don't um, don't recall but I think Scholastic had, was more involved because we rarely saw the Nickelodeon people around they were you know the distributor they didn't know them. as long right. as they show full frontal nudity they were fine so. alright yeah. uh, there's a lot a lot of animals in Animorphs obviously it's kind of in the title um was this your first major production with animals on that level? Uh, let me think. Um, yeah, I'd, uh, I worked with some animals. I did a, a science fiction movie in London called The Tomorrow People, based on an old sci-fi mm-hmm. series they had there. And we had a bunch of animals in that. We had um, like chimpanzees and a couple of lions and stuff. So I sort of knew that this was what it was. But um, what it's interesting, when you're directing animals you don't direct them I mean basically animals yeah. will do one of two things they'll either go toward the food that you lay out for them they'll come to the food or go to the food um, that's pretty much it right. so when you're doing something like animorphs they would come in and they would shoot the actors and then say okay then we'll shoot the animals afterwards and then they would spend hours trying to get the animals to do something that the animals wouldn't do mm-hmm. and when I came on board I said guys you're going backwards First of all, do the animal stuff because they're going to do whatever they do. They're, just, mm-hmm. they're like babies. They're, they're going to do what they do. So shoot them first and then have the actors react to whatever it was that they did. And we would place the animals in via green screens very often. Rarely do we have the actors interact uh, directly with the animals. Although in one rather famous case, um, an actor named Sean Ashmore mm-hmm. gone on to uh, do uh, plays Ice in the X-Men series. Marvelous right. kid, great actor. And uh, he was, 
man, I just shiver even to think about this. We had a scene with a white tiger. And the deal was that Sean had to touch the tiger in order to get its DNA and change into a white tiger. I forget the reason why. But anyway, so he uh, was supposed to do this. And he goes in the cage with the tiger. And the trainer said to us, yeah, well, you know, he can go in, touch the tiger in the head, and make a f -f 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 sound, which apparently tigers like. So there we all are. We're shooting the scene. And Sean goes in. And we've got the camera sort of through the bars of the cage so you can create the illusion there's no cage there. He goes in, touches the tiger. It works flawlessly. The tiger gives him this little look and then leaves. And it's great. We have two cameras rolling on the tiger and on the kid. So he's actually really touching the tiger. It's a real deal. And it's all over. We come out. We close the gate up. And everything's fine. They're going, okay, we got that. And the trainer says to me, boy, that's pretty lucky because, you know, you can't really train tigers or wild animals. So, mm -hmm. so you're telling me that I put an actor, a good one, in a cage with a wild animal that could have taken his arm. I said, oh, yeah, he could have turn and attack because you never know with these wild animals and it was that moment I thought there's got to be a better way to do a show like this than chucking actors you know you know union members into a cage with a wild animal there must be a better way to go than that so you know, right. it's like working with Charlie Sheen <laughs> no. um, do you have any uh, particularly strong memories on the set good or bad Oi, uh, you know it's funny I'm just when we first talked, I was trying to think about this stuff and think back to this. I mean, what I remember was the kids are great, the, 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 the central characters. Um, and I just saw Brooke Nevin the other day at a TV critics thing they had in L.A. She's on some new series. And we were, I haven't seen Brooke in like 10 years. Mm -hmm. And when you go through experience on a television series, because I ended up doing quite a, directing quite a few of those shows. And, and when you have an experience of being on a series with, with someone, it's like being at war. And so you really bond. And a lot of those kids, I know they all still have remained friends, certainly. So my experience, my, my memories of that are of being with those kids and being, I mean, they were all like 18, 19 years old because you don't want kids because you, you can't yeah. shoot the hours. You, um, but I, yeah, my recollections were the, the we had lots of fun. We went to restaurants, you know, and we had, it's the, it's the off camera stuff or the offset stuff on a series that you remember more than anything else because it's the, the, the bonding stuff and, and making it, um, making it an enjoyable experience for everybody. Um, I, you know, what I most fondly recall were the last three episodes during that trilogy because we shot them all together like a 90 minute movie, which they had released, I think, as a 90 minute TV movie. Um, and because that was, I had written those scripts sort of from scratch. I basically looked at the books and was like, okay, whatever it is. And then sort of created these stories based on how the characters had arced over the two seasons of the show and based on the strengths of our actors as well. And so doing that, I remember that very fondly. And, and um, it was a lot of fun. That was, that was pretty enjoyable because they were, the actors were invested by then in the characters. And so they really had, they knew who the characters were. And so they were comfortable in those roles. 